Okay, we're going to start at verse 18 then. Because there is wrath, beware lest he take thee away with his stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Will he esteem thy riches? No, not go, nor all the forces of strength. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. Elihu is cautioning Job right here not to keep his anger to God, but to be wise and to get right with the Lord so his anger would be turned away from him. Now remember, Elihu's thinking, Job, he's thinking Job is, is guilty of sin, all right? And he's telling him to do this. He said, there's no escape in his judgment with money or gold. There's no escape. And you can't use them to deliver yourself from the judgment of God. How many of y'all uh, know that there's people who think they can buy their way to heaven? There's people who think that. They give to the church. They think that's their good deed. You know, that's be- that's the Lord's going to look down at them because they give to the church. You know, the Lord doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our money. Tithing, like I said before, tithing is just to show us where our faith is. You know, do we believe Him when He says, "You give me ten percent, and I'll open the windows of heaven and pour down blessings on you"? Do we believe that? Is what He's saying. Now, it's up to us whether we believe it. If we believe it, we're going to tithe. People say, what if we, I can't afford it. Well, that's why you can't afford it, because you're not tithing. Mm-hmm. Believe me, if the Lord says, tithe, and I'll p- open the windows of heaven and pour down blessings, it, it, that's a promise from Him. Mm-hmm. And this is the only verse in the Bible that the Lord said, nowhere else in the Bible, this is the only place in the Bible where the Lord said, test me. Mm-hmm. That's the only place He said to test me. So, there's people who who really believe, well, yes, they got the money, they can get right with God. Well, we know that's not true. Now, he's also telling Job here to leave the sin. You know, to leave the sin that he's, he's, he's in. And to accept the suffering. If we remember this, what Moses did when he was in Egypt. Moses chose to be with God's people. He had a choice. He could have lived a lifestyle of luxury under, under kings and stuff. I mean, equal with kings. He could have chose that. But he chose affliction. He chose because he knew his people were slaves. But he chose to live that way because he chose God. And we do exactly the same thing in our lives. That's what pe- we have to do. Okay, Lord, do I want to live for you? Because we're going to learn that suffering is going to be in our life. But the, so, uh, Job, this book is going to teach us that. But like Moses, he had a choice. Do I live like I want to live with luxury? Or do I live with my people in suffering? And pretty much that's what's going on in the world. Do, do I want to live the way I want to live? The way I like? Mm-hmm. Or do I want to live over here with Christians who are being persecuted in a lot of places? Mm-hmm. Or being a Christian and not being accepted? Because mm-hmm. like I've said all the time, if you're a Christian, you're not going to be a very popular person. Right. You're not going to be popular. Christians are not popular in this world because we're not of the world. So we're not going to be popular here. If you want to be popular, you cannot be a Christian. Okay? Because we're not of the world. Verses 20, verse 22. Behold, God, God exalteth by his power. Who teacheth like him? Who hath enjoined his, him his way? Or who can say, thou hast wrought iniquity? Elijah was saying that God is all powerful. And there was no one, there was no one who can teach like he does. And there is no one who can teach like him. But praise God, he gives us the Holy Spirit. Okay? Praise God for men who receive the Holy Spirit and use it. Amen. This is what I do. Believe me, it's from the Holy Spirit. It's from the Holy Spirit. I cannot do this in the flesh on my own. Oh, I could, like a lot of preachers, but I'd be taking the verses out of context. I'd be making them mean something else, what I think they mean. But when you do it in the Spirit, who can teach you better than the Holy Spirit. And he said, who can tell him that he is wrong on chastising him? Who can tell God you're wrong for for doing what you're doing to Job? Even though Job didn't deserve it, but that applies to anything, you know. If the Lord chastises you, he's just. Who can tell God you were wrong by 
uh, chastising this brother or sister. Who are we to tell God, I don't think that was right. <laughs> no way, huh? The Lord is Lord, he is God. Verse 24, remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold. Every man may see it, men may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be stretched out. It says, give God the glory for all he has done. Men can see, not not to uh, let me make sure that you understand it. What God has done, okay? When the Lord moves in us, and we've done something that the Lord has moved us to do, not to take the glory upon ourselves like a lot of men do. Look what I've done. No, when God, when He gives us the, when He does the glory, we need to give it to the Lord, so they can be able to see it from its distance. He said, even here, look how how great it is and. And it says in 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve, For we now see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, now I know in part. So we have the glory. We have the glory, but we only see, we, cannot, we only see the Lord through a dark glass right now. When, when we go to be with him, then we'll be able to see clearly, okay? But right now he's saying, hey, what you see can glorify me. What I've shown you, what I revealed to you here, down here, you can, it, you can glorify me. That will glorify me. Be in the light. Remember I said, he is the glory and we're the, we're, he is the light, we're a light. And we should glow with that light that we have to show his glory. And from verses 27 to, from verse 27 all the way to chapter 37, verse 13. Okay, right here. Now, I'm going to show you, because I'm finished tonight, that some of these verses have to do with the tribulation. Some of these verses. But these verses right here, I am not going to go into the tribulation part. Okay, uh, we're, we're, we're learning about Job tonight and the things involved with Job. But uh, if you want to read them, you can read them. But this mainly has to do with the tribulation time. You know, So uh, I'm going to skip those. And you'll see later on what I'm talking about. But I'm, I'm going to skip those verses because I'm not teaching on tribulation. But he did throw that in there. And why? I don't know. I can't explain why he put those verses in. Just threw them in there. I just finished with verse 26. Now, now these verses 14 through 18. Elihu is asking Job, Do you know why God can control all this? He's telling Job, stop and look at all at what God can do. That's verses through eight, 14 through 18. And then verse 19, it says, Teach us what we shall say unto him, for we cannot order our speech by reason of darkness. Elihu is saying, Job, teach us. He's saying, you have approached God. Let us know how to speak to him. Because we, we just know a little bit. Now, he's not really saying that to Job like he really means it. He's kind of like just making fun of him. Kind of like, because right. that's, not, that's not what he really means here. You know, you tell us. And in verse 20, Shall it be told him that I speak? If a man speak, surely he shall be swallowed up. In verse 21, And now men see not the bright light which is in the clouds, but the wind passes and cleanses them. Fair weather cometh out of the north with with God is terrible majesty. <clears throat> we can't see the Lord because of the clouds is what it's saying. Because the clouds are dark and thick. But we look to the north and we can see there's a clearing. So since we see there's a clearing, and this is what the verse is saying, since there's a clearing out there, at least we know God is not is not bringing a flood upon us. You see, they know about the flood. All right? But at least we know he's not bringing a flood on us like he once did. And, he's, and he never will. The Bible plainly says that we, He's going to destroy the earth again. But next time it's going to be by fire, not by water. Verse 23. Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent, he is excellent in power and in judgment. And in plenty of just, justice, he will not afflict. We can't understand the power of God. But we know he's just and merciful. We know he is. Because if he wasn't, then why would we want to put our faith in him? And he doesn't destroy the righteous. 
He will destroy the wicked, but he's not going to destroy the righteous. And any man who is born again believer is a, is a righteous man. He will destroy the wicked. Now verse 24. Men do therefore fear him. He respects not any that are wise of heart. We fear him, and those who think they have great wisdom, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything to them. Like I told you before, men with, with, that are very intelligent, who think they have great wisdom, well, we already know what the Lord said about the world's wisdom. To, to the Lord, that's just foolishness. You know, and that's what it's saying here, that men think they don't need to fear him because they have all this wisdom. And that's exactly what happened to his three friends. Uh, Eliphaz, you know, he was from a nation that was that was known for their great wisdom. Well, we're going to see what God has to say to Eliphaz, Eliphaz about his great wisdom and later on. Chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? But the Lord is saying, Who is misusing my words? And Job has misused them. Well, all, all of them have. Okay? I've taught that. Instead of his words bringing light, it's bringing darkness. And that's, that's what happens. When you misuse use the wrong motives with, with God's words, that's what you're going to do. You're going to bring darkness. His words are full of light. If you use them the way the Lord meant for them to be used. Uh, as we know, that's why we have a lot of different denominations out there because people... They make the scripture sound like what they want, all right? And there's there's a lot. But the Lord did say there's gonna be a lot of wolves out there. And they are. So we need to we need to be careful on who we listen to. Even me. Be, you know, check me out. Read the scriptures for yourself. Make sure I'm not taking them out of the context. Make sure I'm not doing that. Because there are believe me, there's preachers out there, they look like preachers, they sound like preachers, they act like preachers. But they're wolves. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Be very careful. Just because they have the title, don't take it. Well, this is a man of God. Just because they have the title, don't do it. Make sure you check them out. My own Bible study teacher, my own, uh, my own teacher. I mean, this man is—he's got the gift of teaching. He's very, very intelligent. He's got the gift of teaching. And, but I still check him out. I still have because he is a man, and the Lord said it's better to put your trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in a man. So always seek the Lord on whatever teachings I give you. Seek the Lord and say, Lord, did he did he did he did he tell me right? Show me, you know. If he didn't, show me, and he will. The Lord's always ready to help you. He's always there. He's ready. If your heart is true and you're wanting to know the truth, he's going to show it to you, and he will show you. This is a wolf. Stay away. He will show you. And then it's up to you if you believe him or not. Because there's a lot of wolves out there. But because of the way they act, the way they look, people think they're, oh, they're holy. Even with me. Because, I mean, like my wife and these two, they know me. You know, check me out. Check me out. Don't take for granted. Oh, Jesse, oh, he knows. Nope. Check me out. Make sure I'm not a wolf leading you, leading you in the wrong direction. Because wolves, they're your friends. They're not your enemies. You hear me? They're your friends. They will be good to you. All right? Watch out for the wolves. Job has been saying all along that he wants God, he wants to talk to God face to face. Now the Lord does talk to Job in a whirlwind. And I'm sure, uh, like we see it on the Ten Commandments, it's a deep voice. But believe me, if the Lord speaks to you, it's not like me speaking to you. When the Lord speaks to you, you're going to tremble. I'm not guaranteed you're going to tremble. If God speaks to you, <laughs> you're, you're going to hear it and you're going to tremble. It's not like another man talking to you. I'm sure Job is having second thoughts on wanting to talk to, to the Lord face to face. You know? And plus, another thing, nobody, none of us will ever see, well not ever, but no man can see God face to face and live. That's what the Bible says. Verse 3. Gird up down thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. God is saying, you wanted some answers from me, demanding them? Well, here I am. But instead of me answering you, 
you're going to answer me. That's what the Lord is saying right here. Now the rest of uh, chapter 38 uh, and 39, the Lord has several, he does. It says right here that, that I want you to answer me. He gives Job several, from, from here on all the way in chapter 39. All he does is ask Job a bunch of questions. And Job didn't know him, and we don't know him. If you read, read chapter 39, see if you can answer any of those questions. God asks Job several questions just to show him, hey, you don't know anything. Job didn't know him, and we don't know him. And that's, he's just proving the point. Hey, I am God. You want me to answer your question? You can't even answer mine. That's, that's the rest of chapter 38 and chapter 39. So, again, uh, I'm not going to go through it because it's just a several questions, a lot of questions that he asked Job, and Job could not answer not one of them. Again, that's just showing, God is just showing them, you know, who are you? You can't even answer these questions. Who are you to tell me, you know, how, how I should treat you or whatever? You understand? So now we're going to jump down to chapter 40. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth, reproveth God, let him answer it. And God is saying, Job, do you still want to argue with me? <laughs> After all this, Job, do you still want to argue with me? Do you still want to face me face to face? That's what he's saying to Job. In verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vow, vow." First, what was Job saying? He kept saying, I'm innocent. I'm a righteous man. All of a sudden, after listening to the Lord, after, when God finally speaks to him in the whirlwind, like I said, that's not like man to man. When the Lord spoke to Job, the Lord spoke to Job. And now he's saying, he's not longer saying, no longer saying I'm righteous and I'm innocent. Now he's saying, I am vile. He says, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. So all of a sudden, Job, who has been saying a whole lot about being innocent, now he's saying, I'm a, I'm a wretched man. Now that he's confronted by God, he can see and know what it means in Isaiah 64, 6. It says, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Job has realized all this righteousness he thought he had after the Lord speaking to him. Now he realizes all his righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. All right, that's what he's that's what he's realizing. Job said once and even twice that he wanted to confront God, but now he's saying, "I will cover my mouth and I will say no more." When God finally confronts us, He's, he's going to put us in our place. We might act big and bad, and, but once God does confront us, He's going to put us in our place. You know, Just like He does Job right here. Believe me, Job learned, hey, I'm not saying anything about the Lord anymore. Verse 6, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of a whirlwind and said, Gird up the loins now like a man, I will demand thee, and declare unto me, Wilt thou also doesn't know my judgment? Will thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? The Lord is telling Job, Be a man now. You can say these things, so let's see if you're going to stand behind them. All these things that Job had said, let's see if you're going to stand behind all these things you, you, you've been telling me. And he said, I will ask you a question, and you will answer me. That's what he says right here. Are you going to keep on talking about me? Putting my justice, justice down? Condemning me? So you can show your righteousness, which we know that's what Job was doing. He kept saying, I've done nothing wrong. And like I said before, what he was doing, if I'm not, if I'm not doing wrong, then it must be the Lord that must be doing wrong. He's telling them right here, huh, you know, you're going to stand behind that now? After the Lord has spoken to him. <clears throat> Verse 9, how's thou, how's thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majestic, majesty, I mean, and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Job, are you as strong as I am? That's what he's saying. Are you as strong as I am? Do you have the voice of authority? 
The Lord has the voice of authority. We haven't heard him, but when you do hear him, you're going to know what the voice of authority is. Job, if you then now show yourself to be like me, to be perfect in all that you do, have the light of glory, show your splendor. He said, show, show me your splendor. If you're, if you're all that you say you are, innocent, righteous, if you, if you think you're like me, then show me all this stuff. Show me how strong you are. Show me your voice of authority. Show me all this. This is what he's saying in verse 9 and 10. In verse 11, Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold everyone that is proud and abased him. Look mm -hmm. on everyone that is proud and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their face in secret. So he's saying, God, God is saying, if you're like me, show your anger. Show your anger. Do what I would do with people who show their anger. If you're like me, if you think you're as righteous as I am, then do all these things. You know, show the wicked. Show them where they're at. You know, uh, he's really getting on Job here, okay? He's, he's saying, bring justice to the wicked. Put them in their place. Can you do that? He's saying, can you do that, Job? Show them the dust they came from, that they can't hide their face. In humility is what he's saying. So he's telling Job, like I said, he's really, <laughs> if I was Job, I wouldn't, I, I'd be hiding my face. I'd be in the ground. <laughs> Verse 14, 14. Then will I also confess unto thee that thy own right hand can save thee. He's saying, Job, if you can do all this, then I will allow all this righteousness you've said you got, then I will allow you to get by with everything you said to me. But we know that's not true. All right? We know that's not true. We know Job has been wrong on a lot of things, a lot of statements he, he's, he's had through this book. In verse 15, Behold now, behemoth. Now this is, this is an animal. Which I made with thee. He eateth grass and oxen. Now this verse right here, it puts away that we came from apes. It totally puts away that we evolved from apes, like people think. Because right here he says, Behold now behemoth, which is an animal, which I made with thee. God said, I made you the same time I made this animal. You all hear me? Mm -hmm. So we didn't come from animals like people think. This right here shows it. God plainly says, I made you when I made this animal. Amen? Amen. <laughs> it's just simple verses like this. Very simple. That's all you have to do is read it. Very clear. Mm -hmm. But you have people that say we came from apes. and mm. I don't know how they get by with it, but people believe it. This animal is one that we don't, we don't know about this animal. Now, some, some uh, commentaries and stuff, they, they say it's a hippopotamus. This is not a hippopotamus. Mm. Okay? It is not. And as we read the verses, we'll see this is not talking about hippo. This is a, this is a big animal. And we'll get more on it. Verse 16, lo now, his strength, now we're talking about the animal now, this animal, lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Now, hippopotamus, who knows what a hippopotamus tail looks like? Is it like a cedar tree? <laughs> No. He's saying that this animal has a tail like a cedar tree. Now, can this be a hippo? Where they get this is a hippopotamus. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It just, I don't know where people come up with this stuff. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bone. What did I say? His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. This is not a hippopotamus. He is the sheep chief of all the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach up unto him. The Lord is saying that this animal is the biggest and the strongest he's made. This is how big this animal is. We have not we have not seen an animal like this. Verse twenty Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the in the covert of the of the weed and fins. Thy shady trees cover him with their shadow. The widows of the brook compass him about. 
Behold, he drinketh up a river, he hasteth not, hasteth not, he trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. Talking about the Jordan River. Big I'd have to say this is a pretty big animal. <laughs> I mean, to draw up the water from the Jordan River. <laughs> now, this this has got to be a big animal. And like I said, this is an animal we've never seen before. And I really, truly believe from the scriptures, from these scriptures and the scriptures I'm going to give you, I really, truly believe he's talking about dinosaurs. Some people say dinosaurs weren't, but then some people say they do believe in dinosaurs. You have Christians who don't believe in dinosaurs. But right here... If, as I keep reading, I really believe this is a dinosaur. Now, in uh, in the teaching that I had that I gave y'all on God and science, y'all should remember. You know, I talk about this, this about dinosaurs. You know, mm-hmm. that there were dinosaurs. They even had more, huh? In verse twenty-four, he he taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierces through snares. Mainly, what this is saying: no one can catch this animal. Now he talks about this animal. Now, in verse forty-one, um, chapter forty-one, he starts talking about another animal, just like the one we just read. And again, commentaries and stuff say this is a crocodile. Please, please, oh my gosh! Y'all gonna see? I'm gonna read the verses to y'all, and then y'all then tell me if y'all think this is a crocodile. All right? Oh, you're about to read? Yeah. yeah. Chapter forty-one. Now he starts talking about this other animal. Cassis thou draw. Canst thou draw out Lephiaphan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? Will he make a covenant with thee? Would thou take him for a servant forever? Would thou play with him as with a bird? Or would thou bind him for thy maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Meaning, you know, are we going to eat him? Make a, shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barred iron? Or his head with fish spears? Lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. And it's saying it's, none of this is going to help you. Shall not one of be cast down even at the sight of him. And this is another big animal. But this is more than a dinosaur, in which I'm going to read to you. And, but all of a sudden, the Lord's talking about these two animals, these two big creatures. You're thinking, okay, we're talking about Job and all this. Now he's talking about two Two, uh, two giant animals, you know. What he's shown is that he he made these animals. God created everything, right? He he's what he's shown here. He made these monster animals, these creatures. He made them. So if he made them, what's that make God? If he made them, what's that make God? Creator. I mean, he if he can create something as monstrous as this, what he's talking about these right here. And that's what God is doing here. That's why he's talking about these two animals. If these animals are so uh, that you can't even catch them, you can't, you know, you can't eat them. I mean, you can't even, you know, nothing with them. They, they're like, they do what they want. Now, if they're like that, and man, and man can't touch them, and God, the one, and God is the one who created them, what does that say about God? He made those animals. God made those creatures as big, as strong as they are, God made them. God made them. And this is what he's doing right here, talking about two two creatures here. In verse 10, None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? If no one can stand before me, this animal, then can anyone or, or can anyone or anything conquer the Lord? If they can't even control what God created, this is what this verse is saying, if they can't even control what God created, and he's telling Job again, how are you gonna how are you gonna tell me what's what? When you can't even take care of this. Something that I created. You understand what I'm saying? This is what these verses are doing. Verse eleven. Who has prevented me that I should repay him? Who 
whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. What he's saying here is, that I don't owe anyone because everything is mine. That's what God is saying. I owe no one anything. I created everything. That's what he's telling Job. <clears throat> now, in the rest of the verses, he speaks about this Lafayette fan again. He's just talking about how powerful it is. Okay, I'm not going to read them, but that's what he's saying in the next verses. Now, we're going to see that this animal is a fire-breathing dragon. Mm. You hear, are you listening to me? The Bible. I'm, I'm going to give you the Word of God, okay? The Bible says that this is a fire-breathing dragon. In verses 19 through 21. Verse 19. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go the smoke, as out of seeneth pot or cauldron. His breath kindles coal, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Fire comes out of his mouth. This is what God is saying. This animal, this is what it does. Fire comes out of his mouth. Not only does it say it here, but in Isaiah 20, 20, verse, uh, chapter 27, verse 1, it says, in, the, in that day the Lord with his sword and great strong sword shall punish. Now, again, this is what I'm saying. These verses have a, a, a tribulation meaning. And I'm going to tell you why. But right here he's saying that the Lephi, you know, the Lephi fan, Pierce ser, servant, serpent, even the Lephi fan, that crooked serpent. Y'all getting it? And he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. And we know that this creature here, uh, it is a dragon of the sea. Because in verse 15, it says that it has scales. Like a fish. Alright? So, this, this animal here can fly and can go into the, into the ocean. It's from the sea. And he calls it a dragon. <clears throat> in, in Isaiah 30, verse 6, it says... That this Leviathan is also a fire flying serpent. Huh. This is the word of God. Y'all hear me? Yeah. The, you know, dragons are not a myth. Mm -hmm. Fire breathing dragons are not something, a storytelling myth that we came up with. In fact, where do you think they came up with it? A long time ago, they read this. Right? But you don't hear anybody preaching or teaching that, do you? Yeah. No, this is the first time. Huh. But I've, I've given you the scriptures right there to show you. These are the words of God. He says it's, it's a dragon. He says it, it's, he throws flames out of his mouth. And that flies. I mean, this is the word of God. Like I said, these verses also have a spiritual meaning. The word serpent and dragon are in the scriptures meaning the devil. When you use the word serpent and uh, dragon, it's, it, it's talking about the devil in many verses. And if we look at down at verse 34, this is what I'm saying. It's got a tribulation uh, meaning. Down in verse 34, we can see that the spiritual meaning in this verse is speaking about the devil. Because he says, Beholdeth all high things, he is king. He is king. Now he's calling this animal a king, a he. But this is the spiritual tribulation side of it. That's why I'm trying. To, that's why I'm trying to tell you. There's there's a tribulation teaching here, but I, I'm not going to get into it. But verse 34, he beholdeth all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Who's the children of pride? I've taught that already. It's lost people. Who's over the lost people? The devil. And then you'll find in tribulation the devil is called the dragon. In Genesis, the devil's called the, the a serpent, right? So this is there is a spiritual meaning here, speaking about tribulation. But like I said, I'm not going to get into that. But mainly what I'm showing here is, you know, why is he telling us about these animals? He's telling us about these animals just to show who he is, how powerful God is. If God can make something like that, if he can make something like that, what's that say about the Creator? Now think about it. We're Christians here. We go out there and say, there were dragons, and there were fire-breathing dragons. This is not a myth. This is not just a, a storytelling thing. This is true. People, anything we say about the Word of God, most of this, most of this means absolutely, there's no understanding from the lost people. They cannot understand. God says, you need money, give money. That's not the world way. 
The world's way is not, well, I, I need, so I'm going to give. God's ways are not our ways. I mean, there's things in here we could talk to people and it make us sound like we're crazy. Okay, it does. And we'll go tell people, you know, there were really fire dragons. You know, that's, uh, you know, some people might look at us like, man, there's something wrong with you. But that's with all the Word of God. When we gave Him our life, well, when I gave Him my life, when I gave Him my heart, I said, Lord, I'm going to believe everything in here. I'm not going to choose what I want to believe. I'm not going to do that. Whatever you say in here, I'm going to accept it. And that's what I've done with my life. I accept everything in here. There's Christians, and there are born-again Christians, who do not do that. If, this, if there's a verse in there and they don't like it, oh, I don't think I can do that. Well, they look over it and they don't do it. Well, when they do that, listen to me. When a Christian does that, we need to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. This is very important. Y'all need to write this down and put it in the kitchen, put it in the bathroom or something. But just remember this. But without faith, listen to me. The Word of God says, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. God has said, without faith, it is impossible to believe Him. So if there's things in here that we can't do or we don't want to believe it, God says right here, without that faith, you cannot please Him. That's, that's, that's pretty, think about it. Sila. Remember what I told you what Sila means? Meditate on that. Meditate on it. Are there, are there some verses in here that you're like, uh, well, I know it's true, but, and you put a but in there. And there's, there's Christians who do that. And when you do that, right here, Hebrews 11.6 is for you. It's for those who, are, who believe that way. You cannot please God. If you don't have faith on what he says here, it's, I mean, I'm not the one saying this. God has said, if you don't have faith on what I say, you cannot please me. I hope y'all hear. Let him who have ears hear. You cannot please God if you don't have enough faith that all this is true. Everything that he said. Everything. That's big. That is big. I hope y'all hear me. Because verse... Hebrews 11, 6, is, uh, that's, that's not a small verse there. But without faith, is it impossible? It, the Lord said is it impossible? it's impossible to please Him. Okay, last chapter in Job. Finally. <laughs> Finally. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Lord, I know you can do everything you want, is what he's saying. And no one can hide anything from you, is what Job is saying. Verse 3, Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful, too wonderful for me, which I knew not. So what Job is saying here, Lord, I'm one of them. I'm the one who did not understand. I did not understand you. And the things he said, Job now knows that the things he has said has been foolish. He said, I said these things and I knew nothing about it. He made comments on things that he knew nothing about. That's what Job is saying right here in this verse. Do we have people who do that today? We have a lot of people who do that today. They say things that they really don't know nothing about. Just like I told you last week or whatever, people who come to me and want to argue the scriptures, well, they don't argue the scriptures. What they're arguing is what they think. Because they're not coming to me with the scriptures. They're coming to me with their opinion or what they think. Well, like I said before, I'm sorry, but I have, I have told people, well, you know what? If you don't know what's in here, then you're not even qualified to argue with me. You're not even qualified because how can you argue with me if you don't even know what's in here? You're telling me what you think or your opinion. I'm not telling you what I think. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm giving you the word of God. If I come to you, I can back up everything I say with this. That's the way we should be. That's the way we should be. Uh, like I said, be careful who you listen to because people, a lot of people have their opinion and what they think. Well, come to me with the scriptures. If you say, well, in verse, in the book so-and-so, verse so-and-so, 
Now I'm going to listen to you. Okay, let's talk about that. Let's, let's see what that means. But if you come to me and you, don't, and you can't back it up with this, I don't want to hear you. I don't even want to hear you. You understand what I'm saying? And I'm not acting big and tough, but it's the truth. If you don't know what this says, then don't come and tell me how it is. Four, here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare unto me. Job is saying, Lord, you have demanded me to speak, and now I'm going to answer you. Verse 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes seeth thee. Job saying to the Lord, I have heard all about you. I've heard about you, Lord, but now I see you. Not see him physically, because we can see God without seeing him physically. I have seen God, but the, the ways and, 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 and his, his, judgment, his justice, his, his righteousness, I have seen it. And that is God. And when you see these things, that is God is what you're seeing. The love, all this, the mercy, when you finally see it, what is really, truly mercy, like I taught on the Beatitudes, the, the, you can see God that way. He's not talking about now I can see you like I can see you. But because of what he says and what he's done, now, he's, now Job is saying, Lord, I can see you now. My eyes are open to you now. And verse 6, Wherefore, this is Job, Wherefore, I abhor myself, abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. It already remember in chapter forty, verse four. He says, "I am witched, witched." Now he's saying, "I hate my." Oh, abhorred means hate, because the word supposed to abhorred. The Bible says sin. We're supposed to hate sin. I mean, is there some sin out there that we don't hate? We have to. We all have to say yes to that. We all have to say yes to that. Ain't nobody in here that can say no. I hate all sin. Because there's some things I watch on TV as a Christian I should not watch. I shouldn't be watching it. And that's something I need to correct myself. But the Lord said to hate sin. Right here, Job is saying, I hate myself. For the way he's talked about the Lord, the way he's complained to the Lord. He said, I hate my." Job is saying, I hate myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. Well, back then, that's when they really humbled themselves to the Lord, or they were in sorrow and pain, that's what they would do. They would fall on the ground and throw dirt on their back, or ashes. That's what they would do. And that's what Job is doing here. He was showing his humility shown that I was totally wrong in what I've been saying. Verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For you have not spoken of me the things that I was right, as my servant Job hath. Now remember at the very beginning, I told you about these three guys? There's teachers who say that these three guys were Christians. Mm. God right here says no. He said, y'all have, spoke, y'all have not spoken the right things of me. Mm. In verse 8, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job. Now he's calling Job his servant. Don't you know? We are servants to the Lord. Mm. We're his children, but we're servants to the Lord. And offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you for him will I accept lest I deal with you after your folly in that ye have not spoken of me the things which is right like my servant Job he's saying almost the same thing but he tells us the Lord's telling them <clears throat> what to do he says this is what you need to do and, <clears throat> and then go to Job and make this burnt offering do you think the the seven has any kind of a symbolism? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But okay, <laughs> but it does. Okay. Uh, as we know, the, there's numbers in the Bible that mm-hmm. that they they do have a symbolism. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, now and he says, "Go to Job, make this burnt offering for yourselves, and I will accept your offering through Job, mm-hmm. through Job." Right. What did Job? With those who were here since the beginning, what did Job do with his kids at the very beginning? He had his kids come over, and he had he offered God up burnt offerings for his kids. Like I said, he was the man of the house, the priest of the house, and this is what he did for his kids. Well, now he's telling Job to do it for these three guys. He's saying, if you do it that way, I will accept it, just like he accepted it from Job when he did the same thing for his kids. <clears throat> and I will not destroy you, is what he's saying, like I should. He's saying, like I should. 
for the things you have said. So Eliphaz, well, all three of them, they went and did according to the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned their captiv- the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Mm-hmm. After the Lord accepted his prayers from his friends, he gave Job twice mm-hmm. what he had before. Mm-hmm. Now, listen. Job forgave those three friends. He forgave them. Mm-hmm. If we, if we, have grudges against anyone, saved or lost. If we hold grudges against any person, mm-hmm. how would the Lord, is the Lord going to bless us? Mm-hmm. The Lord blesses you when you forgive. Mm-hmm. That's what it's shown here. Since you did this, Job, since you forgave them, because that's my heart, the Lord's heart, I'm going to give you twice what you had. Not only because of what you went through, but he says, because you forgave them. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. Because if he wouldn't have forgiven his friends, the Lord wouldn't have given them twice of what he had. So we need to be very careful that we don't hold grudges against a saved or a lost person, anyone. As Christians, we should not do that. We are, we don't do that. All right, that is not in God's heart, so it shouldn't be in our heart either. Now, when we think. We've had great losses like Job. Job lost his wealth, his kids. He lost his health. When we think of, of things that are might be great to us, what we think is great, whether it be our job, the things we have, you know, if we lose those, we're like, oh. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. It says, But what things were gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ. We're saying the things that I thought was important to me, mm-hmm. now they mean nothing to me because of the Lord. Amen? Mm-hmm. What you thought was valuable, whatever it was, your job, whatever, what you thought was valuable, saying right here, that's nothing. Mm-hmm. That's nothing compared to Christ. Verse 8, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the elegance of excuse me for my English, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them, but don't, that I may win Christ. All these things mean nothing to me. Again, he's saying all these things mean nothing to me. When I compare to the knowledge of the Lord, man, this this stuff means absolutely nothing to me. Our house that we live in, nice house, we have a swimming pool, you know, Compared to the Lord, that is nothing. That is nothing. You know, I, my riches are right here in my heart. Amen? Where, where are your riches? Where are they? In your heart. Jesus Christ is your riches. and Jesus Christ is your gold, your silver, your everything. Not things that you have, that you possess. Like right here it's saying, that these things that I thought were important to me, that's nothing compared to the Lord. And I give a little, little quick testimony. I was at the gym a long time ago. I mean, I still go to the gym. It don't look like it, but I do. <laughs> but this was another gym that I used to go to. You know, there were about five of us in the hot tub, the spa. And they were talking about richness. They were talking about, you know, what was rich, what rich meant to them. And they all talked about money and material things. And I'm just sitting there. I don't know these guys, but I'm sitting there. And like always, the Lord gives me something to say. I'm going to say it. So I'm like... And I may I put in my two cents. I said, "Well, to me, riches and richness is living for the Lord." Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, like they didn't know what yeah. to say. They were just like, <laughs> oh, <okay>. oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's that. I mean, way back then, I knew that the Lord showed me that. The Lord is everything. That is everything we need is right here in us. Amen. Amen. I don't care if you live in a castle. You have a hundred thousand cars, a hundred billion dollars. You have nothing if you don't have Jesus Christ. Right. Amen? Amen? We need to forget what we thought was important to us. We need to forget that. Our education, a lot of people, their education means everything to them. It's good to have an education. I'm not against education. 
But there's a lot of people who are going to hell because of their education, because they think they already know it all. They don't need the Lord. I'm serious. Like I told you before, educated people are hard to reach. Educated people and religious people, not Christians, Mm -hmm. religious people. They're the hardest people to reach for the Lord. So we need the Lord right here is saying we need to we need to forget about all that. All that is is garbage. It's all garbage. Compared to Jesus Christ, I mean, take all that and compare it to Jesus Christ. It's garbage. Amen. Mm-hmm. Until we start thinking, until we can see that and comprehend, we'll be we're going to be disappointed. Well, I don't have what the Joneses have because we're we're thinking well. I want that too, you know. When you start living that way and you're thinking material things is what you need to make you happy, you are going to be very disappointed. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. You will be. You'll be very disappointed. If you think having money and buying all this stuff is going to make you happy, you can forget it. It's temporary happiness. Mm -hmm. It's temporary, but it's not going to last. Verse 9, it says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. This verse is talking about uh, without our faith in the Lord, we think we think we deserve certain things, that we deserve these things. Oh, people, I've told you before, the only thing we deserve is hell. You hear me? Every one of us in here, the only thing we deserve is hell. And that's why they call what God has given us grace. He's given us grace and mercy. Not is not because we earned it. Don't ever get that through your head that you earned this with the Lord. That's why God said, I'm going to give you my grace and my mercy because you don't deserve it. Do y'all hear me? Mm-hmm. Every one of us, me, every one of us, everybody, born again Christian, every born again Christian, Billy Graham, I mean, the highest man you know of, of uh, a godly man, deserves hell. And God says, this is my mercy. This is my grace that I'm giving you. Nowhere in the Bible does he say we deserve this. He's giving it to us. Amen. Amen. Realize what you what your Lord has done for you. Realize who you are. Once you realize who you are and what God has done for you, believe me, once you really comprehend that, you will you will you will love the Lord. A whole lot more. You will love them and praise them a whole lot more. Once you realize who you really are and what God has done for you. Because he it wasn't because we deserved it. First Peter chapter three, verse fourteen. But if ye suffer righteousness sake, happy are ye. Now this is from the Lord. He's saying, If you suffer for for being righteous, <laughs> he said to be happy. The, the, now, what I said a while ago, that if we say that to someone who's lost, mm-hmm. what? You're supposed to be happy when you suffer? <laughs> they don't understand that, but we're going to understand it. We're, we will understand this. The Lord says to be happy when we suffer for righteousness. Now, if we've done something wrong, which we'll say that later, if we've done something wrong, then we need to pay for it. But when we're being punished for, for being right, the Lord says be happy. And be not afraid of their... their their terror, meaning the evil, the evil that's out there. He says, don't be afraid of it, neither be troubled. If Job would have done this from the beginning, he wouldn't have went through all this complaining and saying all this stuff. But we now, we, we've read Job. We've learned about Job. And we've got the Holy Spirit. So we should not go through things like Job did. Our complaining should come to a big stop. After reading Job, if you still complain to the Lord, then you've learned absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Y'all hear me? Amen. 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 That is an amen. If you still complain after reading Job, learning Job, then you did not hear with the ears that the Lord has given you. Verse 17, For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer well doing. What does it say? The will of God. The will of God. Be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil. Like I said just now. 
if we suffer for doing for being righteous, amen. But he says, but if you suffer because you've done something wrong, well then you're just paying the cost. You're paying for whatever you did. Just like if you if you go out there and you kill somebody, well, you go to prison. When you get born again in prison, well you still gotta serve the time. You still have to serve the time for what it, for what you've done. All right? God's not going to say, well, since you're getting born again now, you don't have to serve your time. No, The Lord's saying right here, if you do evil, if you suffer for doing evil, then you need, that's, that's what happens. But if we suffer for, for being right, amen, amen, amen. I'm just, amen. It's just an amen. I mean, there's nothing else you can say about it. Because the Lord said, if you suffer for being right, he said, be glad. Verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, bring, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Look at how Jesus suffered for us. How many of us know in here how Jesus suffered for us? How many of us know? We've, we've, either, we've either read it, or... We saw the Passion of Christ. Yeah. Or even the little ones like Jesus of Nazareth. It didn't show much suffering there. But Jesus suffered tremendously. And guess what? Listen to me. Jesus suffered tremendously. And he was in the will of God. Do you see that? Do you see how Jesus suffered? And he was in God's will. Was he suffering because he was out of the will of God? No. Our Jesus suffered and he was in God's will. He was doing what God wanted him to do. That's why I love my Lord. 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 and 13. <clears throat> Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. He's saying, hey, don't think it's strange because something happens to you. The Lord is saying, don't, don't, don't act like, well, I'm a Christian. Why did that happen to me? He said, don't be like that. He said, it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. He, it's going to rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So he said, don't think it's strange. He said, he said, don't think like, I can't believe this is happening to me. He's saying, don't do that. But when we go through it, remember Psalms 34 19 it says many are the affliction of the righteous many are the affliction of the righteous but the Lord delivereth him out of them all don't concentrate on the first part of this verse that we are going to have many afflictions in our life don't concentrate on that that's what he says but don't concentrate on that concentrate on the last part of that verse but the Lord will deliver us out of them all out of all of them, the Lord will deliver us. Amen. Amen? Amen? That's what we need to remember. Don't just concentrate, oh my gosh, I'm going to go through a lot of suffering. Yeah? But, the Lord will deliver us out of all of them. He didn't say some of them. He said all of them. Amen? Amen. Verse 13, But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that... When his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. This is what's wrong with Christianity. No one wants to partake of the suffering. Really, seriously. They want all the good that, that the Lord has to give them. But they don't want to do, have the suffering. And that's, wrong with, and that's what's wrong with Christianity today. But he says, at the end, when we go through the suffering, he says, at the end... We will be exceedingly glad. Not just a little glad. He said, we are going to be so happy. We are going to be full of joy at the end. Just like our Lord Jesus. Even though he suffered tremendously. I mean, suffered tremendously. I mean, the stuff he went through, we today as men, you could take the toughest man here on earth today. He could not live through what Jesus went through. But what happened to Jesus at the end? <laughs> Amen. He is with God, the Almighty. All right? He is Lord now. Amen? Amen? So just remember, when we suffer, when we go through things, and you're walking with the Lord, remember, walking with the Lord, because if you're going through them because you've done something wrong, then you have to pay for it. 
But if we suffer for being a Christian, the Lord said at the end, you're going to rejoice. And we will. We are. So the bottom line here, trust in God. Trust in God. This is the words of God. These verses I just gave you, believe them. Trust in them. Now the rest of the verses from 11 to 17, it just shows how the Lord gave everything back to Job, okay? So in closing, what I want to close with, so far, what we've learned about the devil, what we've learned about the devil, he can't foresee the future. He cannot see for Because if he could, then he wouldn't have said, Job is going to curse you. Because the devil said, Job will curse you. So, Job, so the devil can't foresee the future. Because if he could have, he would have known Job was not going to curse God. So he can't foresee the future. We've learned that <clears throat> he can't be everywhere at the same time. Because in the first chapter, God said, where have you been to the devil? And he says, I've been on earth. So... Can the devil be on earth and in heaven at the same time? No. So we learn he can't do that either. The devil isn't all-knowing. He's not all-knowing. Because if he was, he wouldn't have gotten into this contest with the Lord. Because if he would have known, if he was all-knowing, he would have known that Job was going to have the victory at the end. That Job was going to be blessed, doubled from what he had. If he would have known that, he wouldn't have done it. Remember, the, the devil does not want us to have any blessings. He hates it when we get blessings. All right? So if he would have known this, there's no way he would have made, uh, put God to a, to, a, to a contest like that. Okay? So he, he doesn't know everything either. We also learned that the, the devil can't break through God's protection. Did he have to go to God and say, Can I do this to Job? Did he have to go to God? So that tells us right there, Unless God allows him, the devil cannot touch you. He cannot touch you. If he touches you, it's because you have allowed him. And a lot of Christians are that way. The devil, they, 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 are, they live a defeated life because they have allowed the devil to break through. Not break through, they have allowed the devil to do that to them. But right here we've learned, the devil cannot do nothing to you unless the Lord okays it. So don't fear the devil. If you're walking with the Lord, do not fear the devil. He is a wimp. He's nothing. Ooh, Jesse. You're going to say that? Yes, I am. You know why? Because I've got God in me. I've got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus, and Jesus is God. So why? You tell me. Y'all give me one reason why I should fear the devil. Christians. And I'm talking to y'all. Christians, quit fearing the devil. If you're not walking with the Lord, then yes. Because you ain't got no power against him. If you're not walking with the Lord, you don't have the power. But when you're walking with the Lord and you've got the Holy Spirit as your strength, the devil cannot touch you. Please remember that. People, we give them way too much credit. The devil made me do it. No, the devil can't make you do anything. You've allowed him to, to have you do something. You've allowed him to do it. It's not that he made you. So we, we know he can't, he can't do anything to us unless God lets him and asks for permission. And we know, we know, we know that we know from reading Job and because of everything I just told you, the devil is not equal to God. Amen? The devil is not equal to God. If Job, after going through all this, Job, everything he went through, after all that, and now that this is before God gave him twice what he had before. This was before that. What, did, what was Job doing? He was humbling himself to the Lord. He was repenting and humbling himself to the Lord, praising God, before God even gave him all this stuff back. So if Job can do that, when the Lord took, well not the Lord, but when the Lord allowed the devil to take everything from him, now, if Job can go through that and at the end praise praise God, and like I said, he didn't do he didn't praise God. He didn't say the Lord gave him all this back and he started praising God. No, the verses show that he was praising God before God even said anything about him getting double. Okay, so if Job, who lost all that, can end up praising the Lord 
Y'all see what I'm saying? What little bit we go through, and really, whatever we've been through. Now, I didn't lose my daughter. She's with the Lord. I didn't lose her. But I have a daughter with the Lord. That's still nothing compared to what Job lost. I just, I, my daughter went to be with the Lord. But I still had my health. I still had, you know, my job and everything. But Job lost everything. And if he can, at the end, if he can, can praise the Lord, rejoice and praise the Lord, what's that say about us? And we don't even go through half, not, uh, not a fourth of what Job went through. Was this a good teaching? Mm-hmm. This, I mean, thank you for wanting me, for wanting me to teach Job. Because <laughs> uh, it's been a very good study, a very good study. I've learned a lot from studying. I knew a little, but now the Lord has shown me a lot more. Yeah, well, this is the ninth week. But praise God. The book of Job is just not about Job losing everything. The book of Job, like I said before, Job will show you where you're at with your Christian walk. Are we going to be complainers? Or are we going to rejoice? Whatever we have to go through. Amen.